I have to say, we cannot talk about Murray without talking about his other half, uh, his beloved wife, Joey. She, she was wonderful. Uh, a very smart woman, had a master's from NYU in history. She knew everything about American history, about opera. Um, he called her his indispensable framework. And we just have to have a little tribute to Joey Rothbard. She was great. Now I'll turn it up to Walter. Welcome to this panel. Uh, personal reminiscences of Murray. Murray Rothbard, that is, in case you're wondering. Uh, I'm going to call upon people in the order that they're listed in the program, except I've recently been appointed chair of this session, so I'll go last. Uh, it'll be John Denson, David Gordon, Paul Gottfried, and Joe Salerno is taking Lou's place. Um, John Denson was very instrumental in um, setting up the Mises Institute. He was one of the first bulwarks of the Institute. Uh, each speaker will get eight minutes, and I've got my student here, Antone, who will flash a five-minute, a two-minute, and a one-minute sign, after which I will grab you if, you if you don't leave the podium. So I now call upon John Denson. Thank you very much, Walton. The uh, first time I met Murray Rothbard, was in 1976. Uh, I was a delegate uh, to the Libertarian Party Convention. Uh, I had been a, an alternate delegate to the Republican Convention in 68 and a delegate in 72. And as uh, the same thing happened to me as Ron Paul and the 72 Convention and Nixon put on wage and price controls and severed the dollar and so forth. Now she was a Keynesian and I abandoned the Republicans and uh, thought I'd try the Libertarians. Uh, when it, that was a conference uh, where Roger McBride was uh, the presidential nominee, which I thought was a good candidate. He wrote a good book. His uh, father was with Reader's Digest and had given a, reverse, a, a, a revised, shorter version of uh, Hayek's Road to Serfdom. So he was, uh, had some libertarian credentials. Murray was uh, very instrumental in that party. He was serving on the platform committee. And um, he delivered a speech in favor of a non-interventionist uh, foreign policy, which was something I had, I had been searching in the Republican Party for the Robert Taft division and found out it didn't, it didn't exist anymore. So uh, this was a political party that was championing the foreign, uh, no foreign intervention in uh, war. So Murray was very excited about it and so was I. So I wanted to talk to him. I had read his book, uh, uh, the uh, Great Depression, uh, and had taken it actually to the 72 Republican Convention because I found that the people there <laughs> among the Republicans, they said they were for the free market, but we do need government control to prevent depressions and monopolies. So <laughs> I wanted to tell Murray, and I was a little scared to talk to him. I'd never met him, and I knew how famous he was and didn't want to say something stupid. So I just walked up and shook his hand and told him I'd taken uh, the Great Depression to the Republican Party, but unfortunately didn't think it did much good. Uh, the next thing, next time I met Murray was a Cato Institute conference at Dartmouth College, uh, 1979, and uh, the, uh, this was exactly what I had thought needed to be done rather than politics, is uh, go to the uh, intellectual part and develop a critical mass of intellectuals and communicators and students and teachers and uh, that's what I envisioned doing. And I knew that uh, Murray had been one of the three co-founders of the Cato in 1974, and he was instrumental in changing the name to Cato. So he was speaking as was Ralph Rako, and I had gotten very interested in war and World War I, and Ralph was speaking on that. Also, there was a teacher uh, from Auburn University named Roger Garrison, who was very much uh, a follower of Rothbard and Mises. And, uh, that, that is what I thought we were going to try to do at Auburn, was to uh, put together the faculty we had there and invite students and so forth. But I had no idea how to run a conference or a, a, an institute. So uh, I talked to Murray a whole lot at that. It was a week-long conference and to Ralph Rako for a good bit. And then I talked to a girl named Marsha Friedman, who was in charge of that Cato conference. And I told her I was interested 
and what they were doing, and I thought that was the way to go. Uh, and uh, told her that I was uh, interested in trying to do this at Auburn University, if I could put it together and find somebody that uh, you know knew how to do all this. Uh, because it not only takes an intellectual, but an entrepreneur, which of course Lou Rockwell is. And uh, so uh, Murray uh, eventually severed his relations with Cato. Uh, the next thing that I had happened that eventually involved Murray was in 1982, I got a call from a complete stranger named Lou Rockwell. I'd never heard of Lou. And uh, he told me that uh, he was in town and uh, I was in Opelika and uh, he uh, called and said he'd like to come over and talk to me at home. He was going to create an institute called the Ludwig von Mises Institute. And of course I was familiar with Mises. Uh, I'd read socialism and other books and uh, very familiar with Hayek and uh, uh, Hazlitt and all of that by that time and I was just ecstatic. I thought my gosh This is a dream come true. So Lou came over and uh, He told me about his background that he'd been a chief of staff for Ron Paul and I was very familiar with Ron Paul And then uh, he told me that uh, Mrs. Me he talked to Mrs. Mises herself and told her what he wanted to do and uh, She was willing to lend her help and become active if Lou would pledge to support her husband's ideas for the rest of his life. So Lou made this, uh, this promise to her, and uh, it was a pretty risky thing to do to devote his life to something that really wasn't in existence yet. But um, she agreed to uh, be active, and she was made into the chairman. And uh, then he uh, told me that uh, Murray Rothbard had committed to be vice president in charge of academics, and I thought, man, this is, this is sensational. And, he, I said, what can I do? And he said, well, I understand you're on the board of trustees at Auburn University and that you wanted to do something like this. I said, that's exactly right, but I didn't know how to do it. And he said, well, I think I do. So uh, we uh, talked about a proposal to make to Auburn University uh, to connect the institute. He wanted to connect to a major college, so that was why he was calling on me. So we drew up a proposed contract and I took him to meet the president of Auburn University and presented that to him so that they would provide some facilities, physical facilities inside the university. And the Mises Institute would pay money to Auburn University to be used only in the economics department. So it sort of recycled the money. So the Mises Institute started in a small office in Thatch Hall with three people, Lou, Marty, and Pat. And uh, this all still three uh, here, of course. And uh, they had a small room. And over the years, we gradually went up to larger and larger facilities until finally uh, we got the best office and uh, conference room and classroom space for the uh, Mises Institute in the new College of Business, the brand new building. I met with the architect and told him what we wanted, and the president let me do that. And so everything uh, it, uh, gave it great credibility and visibility being a major part of the business school. And then uh, Lou and I both decided it was better to uh, have our own facilities. And of course, if you've been to the uh, Mises Institute now, it's a huge facility, much, much, 10 times bigger than what they had in the business school. And there's still room to, uh, to grow. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing uh, involving Murray uh, was uh, Roseanne, my wife Roseanne and I had uh, invited the faculty uh, every year to come to uh, our home for supper and cocktails. And in 1985, we did a special reception for Murray Rothbard and his wife, Joey. So this gave me an opportunity uh, to have a long, long one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation. I've already, always been scared to, to talk to him because I'm just a lawyer. I'm not an economist or a historian. And, and uh, you know, Murray was so kind to people that talked to him and maybe didn't uh, know exactly what they were talking about. He's very gentle never put you down, uh, very eager to talk. So we looked at my library and my books and we talked and finally Joey came up and, uh, and said, uh, whoa, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, we did the Cost of War Conference and, uh, and he, uh, he said that was the greatest thing, seeing the Mises Institute into uh, a war issue. Thank you very much.
I don't like to brag, but I'm very pushy. And you can see how pushy I was. He's bigger than me, and I pushed him off. But we have to because we have very good other speakers, and we want to get everyone to have a, a turn. The next speaker is David Gordon, who really needs no introduction because he's unique. Uh, when uh, Murray first met David Gordon, he said he had a photographic memory. He knows everything about everything, and he's very creative, and he's uh, the most wonderful addition to our little group. So I present my friend, colleague, David Gordon. Yes. Uh, one thing uh, very important to know about Murray Rothbard was he had an abiding interest in people. He would always have uh, funny stories about various people he'd known. Uh, one example, he knew the uh, historian Harry Elmer Barnes, who was a diplomatic historian, and at one time... Uh, Murray was in charge of uh, having a getting a there was a volume of essays in on, in honor of Barnes it eventually came out under a different editor Arthur Goddard it was called Harry Elmer Barnes Learned Crusader so uh, uh, usually these volumes of essays are in, intended to be a surprise to the person who gets them but Barnes found out about it the, before and what he would do when contributors would send in their essays. If they criticized him, he put in something in the essay, say if they criticized him, Barnes would put in, uh, Professor Barnes would reply in this way. So when Murray was telling me the story, he said, eh, he wrote his own fest shrift. <laughs> now, now uh, an, another one, one thing also about Murray, as you can tell if you've read his, any of his books, he had a tremendous knowledge of details of all kinds. Uh, one thing I like to do is, uh, I have trivia questions, they're usually rather silly ones, but I told him I had trapped Mel Bradford, who was a professor at University of Dallas who knew a great deal of American history himself. I'd given him the question, what was Rutherford in Rutherford B. Hayes' name, what did the B stand for? And I, I told Murray about this, and Murray said, ah, it was Bertrand, of course. <laughs> uh, now, uh, and, uh, and he could do that. He was so good on details. Uh, I remember the uh, first time I heard him lecture was at a Cato conference in 1979 in Eugene, Oregon. And he would said in his lecture, just someone asked him a question, said, oh, there's a good uh, unpublished dissertation at uh, SUNY Buffalo on that subject. Uh, uh, he gave 1965, and he just knew that off the top of his head. But when he uh, was interested in details, he was always in pursuit of liberty. He always had his... his uh, uh, main goal in mind. And on one occasion, I remember uh, there were he when he was teaching at UNLV, he had a course on uh, hit on monetary theory, and in, instead of using the standard textbooks, he used his own book, The Mystery of Banking, and uh, someone, uh, uh, I think some people in the department were protested. They said, oh, we should use the standard textbook. So when he heard about this, he said, ah, I teach the truth. <laughs> and this was uh, one thing that was primary him uh, out. One other story I think I'll, I'll give that shows his, uh, how he was very interested in, in uh, knowing uh, all sorts of what people were doing. I, in uh, one uh, of the Mises University Conference, it was, I think, the last one he went to, which was in Claremont in 1994. I had heard some very good gossip about someone. I won't say what it is, but that would get me into trouble. So I was sitting with him and uh, telling him the story and 
someone, uh, one of the students came up and had kind of, it was just standing there, had kind of a quizzical expression on, on his face. And Murray looked around and said, can't you see we're busy? <laughs> so he, he really wanted to know everything about everything. And in his historical method, he, for him, as you see this in his history of economic thought, he wasn't satisfied just with giving the accounts of the major figures. He would give the uh, all the minor figures as well. All the people he wouldn't just tell you, say, about Adam Smith and others. He'd tell you about James Stewart, uh, uh, Adam Ferguson, uh, people who weren't so well known. And he believed this was the way to do history. You have a total immersion in the sources, and you give the uh, the uh, accounts of everyone's thoughts. So it was uh, one of the great uh, privileges of my life was to know Murray for all those years, and he certainly influenced me more than anyone else, and I'm very grateful to have known him. Thank you. The next speaker is Paul Gottfried, who is a, uh, a historian, an eminent historian, a, a longtime friend of Murray Rothbard's. Uh, he was a professor, an endowed chair at Elizabethtown uh, University for many years. Paul Gottfried. Uh, among the many roles in this uh, life that I have been forced to assume was teaching a Greek class. I was <clears throat> a classicist at one time. And uh, the, uh, uh, one of the assignments that I gave the students toward the end of the semester, which they hardly ever mastered, was learning the opening lines of the greatest literary work of the ancient world and one of the greatest literary works of all times, Homer's Iliad, uh, which starts with the lines, Mene naeda thea peleadeo achilleos, and uh, to translate, O oh, sing, O oh, uh, uh, goddess, uh, about the destructive anger of Achilles, the son of, Pol of uh, Pelasus, um, which caused suffering to tens of thousands of Achaeans or Greeks. Now, the implacable wrath or anger of the semi-divine Achilles, his, uh, his mother is a goddess, drives the ancient narrative, and among the consequences of Achilles' anger, according to Homer, is dragging down the doughty spirits of many brave warriors to Hades and preparing carrion, and the Greek word is chelaria, for dogs and vultures. Now here we are told what happens to those who are afflicted with truly destructive anger, the alumine uh, menus, but I'd like to speak this afternoon about a different mainness or anger, one that does not produce the grave results depicted by Homer. And here I'm referring to the creative fulminations of our late friend and mentor, Murray Rothbard, who showed the positive aspects of becoming annoyed with fools and going after them with unforgettable mockery. The target of Murray's mainness or anger included agitprop leftist movies, modal libertarians, the Coke machine, and just about every neoconservative who came of age in Murray's unfortunately abbreviated lifetime. Murray also convinced me from his polemics that I should fear Mensheviks more than Bolsheviks, that the neoconservative crusade for global democracy, and this is something that Dr. Paul would agree with, could be traced back to Sidney Hook and even further back to the devil. I also learned... <laughs> Uh, I, I fully agree with that sentiment, as everyone in this room must know. I also learned from reading Murray that the American regime had been going downhill with few bright spots since the presidency of Martin Van Buren, and that Lincoln and Wilson were hideous warmongers who could never be su sufficiently discredited or detested. Of course, I didn't need lots of persuading to take over some of Murray's pet peeves. His exasperated laments about lying historians caused me to think about topics that would not have entered my mind before I read Murray. Finally, I'd observed that both of us 
took the same combative stance in presenting ideas. We were both compulsive debaters and landed up refining arguments in the course of lacing into our targets. Here too, Murray's outburst against dishonest historians influenced me. Among his revisionist works that changed or expanded my mind about historical subjects included his essay on the progressive use of war for social planning. And uh, before I go on, let me mention that the book on the progressive era, I will try to limit myself to five more minutes, uh, is one of the best books on the subject I have ever dipped into. Uh, I hardly recommend that all of you buy this. Um, it is, uh, from what I can see, the finest book in the English language on the progressive era. Um, and uh, I also was influenced by Murray's work in the Great Depression. And, and while I had scorned the received interpretations of the origin and causes of World War I throughout my life, my family were on the losing side, uh, of that dust up, I never encountered Harry Elmer Barnes until his name came up in one of Murray's essays. Uh, Murray assured me that Barnes was a good guy, and he did so in the presence of Ralph Rako, who seemed to agree. Because of these recommendations, I read Barnes' work on the First World War, and my newest anthology of essays should make clear that I now deeply appreciate Barnes' intellectual honesty and the accuracy of his observations about shared responsibility of both sides for the war. Um, <clears throat> I, I finally should mention, and I will try to limit myself to the five minutes allotted to me, um, that I suffer egalitarian envy whenever I think of Murray as a polemicist. He was simply better at going after deadheads and unprofessional scholars than I could ever hope to be, and especially now at my advanced age. Murray was the Mozart of polemicists, putting complicated concepts into understandable phrases and deploying them brilliantly against opponents. As polemicists, most of the rest of us are at the competence level of Antonio Salieri, and I'm speaking here about the plotting Salieri of the Mozart movie, not the real Salieri, who was the teacher of Beethoven and Schubert and a distinguished operatic composer. I still recall competing against Murray in the late 1980s in what he called the sweepstakes. Several libertarian and paleoconservative commentators volunteered to respond to a neoconservative critic in a very short live newsletter, which folded right after our, our contributions were published. All of us acquitted ourselves well, but only Murray managed to produce a truly outstanding rejoinder. Um, although I agonized over my polemic, what Murray submitted was simply better crafted. I still read Murray's movie reviews with egalitarian envy, but also delight in the vitriol that he poured over flicks they urged us not to see. One Murray, movie that Murray found ridiculously overrated is The Piano, and he maliciously exposed every ineptitude in this feminist film about a woman in the Australian outback being emotionally and artistically starved by her overbearing husband. Toward the end of the movie, Hubby cuts off a finger from the hand of his defiant wife with an axe. But just despite him, she goes on grinding out melodies at the keyboard with an artificial finger. The piano includes one formulaic love scene featuring Holly Hunter that goes on and on. All we see throughout the ordeal is Holly Hunter's bare back, which provided Murray with the opportunity to expand on the reasons that feminist movies rarely produce convincing love scenes. He remarked at great length with memorable humor on how truly bored he had been staring at Holly Hunter's less than bewitching back for 15 minutes. <laughs> Murray's review had the effect that every time I hear about Holly Hunter or the piano, my mind is immediately drawn to the image of her bare back and to Murray's searing comments about feminist love scenes. Let it be said that beside all his other achievements, no one to my knowledge ever did better skewering a chick flick trying to be a feminist movie than did Murray in this timeless review. Thank you. I think I've uh, Joe Salerno is next. You can see it's sort of like herding cats. Each of these people could speak for hours on end entertainingly, but they only get eight minutes, so here is Joe. I'm standing in for Lou Rockwell. I mean, I'm a poor substitute, but I'm still going to take 12 minutes because I'm Lou's representative. Um, Murray's uh, well-known anti-authoritarianism extended well beyond politics into his uh, personal life. 
Uh, one time I was at a three-day conference with him on uh, the topic of methodology at the U.S. Military Academy in West Point. We were at the hotel there. Um, the receptionists looked like the Stepford Wives, an empty smile. It was very, very, very oppressive. The, um, the bus boys moved like RoboCop. Uh, I, was, I was on the elevator with a um, fellow, a fellow um, graduate student who was attending, and um, he had a shirt on that said, Crush the State. And uh, there, were, there was almost a scuffle. There were a few cadets in the elevator at the same time. I was trying to stand in front of him and obscure it. Anyway, by the second day, Murray was tired of, of, of the, this oppressive atmosphere. And, uh, so, and he began to complain that academics weren't real people. They were too pretentious and stuffy. And, then, and then, he, then he came out and said, Joe, he says, we, we need to go over the wall. We need to break out of the hotel and, and find real people to, to, for, and entertainment. So I asked the hotel receptionist if he had any idea of a, of a, of a nearby place that played live music and, 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 and had dancing, which Murray had requested. Uh, so uh, he gave us a recommendation. And so a bunch of us got into a car, including Murray, and we were in, in, in the, we, we proceeded north in these, this mountainous, windy roads above West Point to go to Newburgh, New York, which is 10 or 20 miles away. And almost immediately, um, a, a very thick fog descended. And pretty soon, it was, we couldn't see past our headlights. We had to slow down to 20 minutes, so that, uh, 20 miles per hour. So at that point, we were all debating whether we should turn back. And of course, the lone descent was, was Murray, who kept saying, onward troops, press onward toward de destination. So he, he didn't want to go back. Um, now, this was the height of the disco era. Um, we wound up having a great time there. There was a lot of dancing and pretty girls, and, and um, Murray was always um, uh, applauding the best dancers and stuff. And actually, some of the, some of the girls came over to us, and, and, were, and they thought Murray was great. They gave him a big hug, and they thought, ah, sweetie. Um, so we, fi uh, we finally decided we had to go back, and, and fortunately, there was no fog. Um, but as I said, it was the height of the disco era. So on the way back, Murray had picked up a few lines from Donna Summer's um, disco song on the radio. And um, he serenaded us all the way back with those few lines. He had a really practiced musical ear, and he had an excellent vocal range. So he actually sounded pretty good. Um, another time, we were at, at, a, co at a conference uh, at a, it was, I think it was Menlo Park, uh, junior college out in um, the Bay Area in, in, uh, in, in California. Uh, and so when we would come back from dinner, it tended to coincide with the hours in which this high school program had its stu study uh, um, hours. So the monitor, every time we'd walk back from, um, at night, it was from dinner, uh, would, would yell out the window for us to keep quiet. Murray was always had a very, was very, always had a loud giggle and was, had an infectious laugh and, and carried. And um, so he, on the second or third day, he got, he got tired of this and, and kind of muttered back, um, you can keep your fascist dump. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the other point I wanted to make was that Murray was, he didn't have a trace of false modesty. Everyone, uh, he, he realized that he, you know, he, uh, he acknowledged his great achievements and so on, and, and, and he liked the fact that people called him Mr. Libertarian and the dean of the, of the Austrian school. But yet he had a deep and profound humility. Um, he, so uh, one, one day I was having lunch with him at his favorite deli in New York City, uh, and it was in the early 90s, and he was working on his, his, his great work on the history of, of economic thought. And um, he was, over lunch, he was eagerly telling me a lot of st uh, stories that David had mentioned, all, he, he, that Murray always focused on the sort of the minor characters, the ones with quirks. And um, so he was going on about how one economist was t totally evil, and um, how uh, modern psychobabble, which he really didn't like, actually explained John Stuart Mill, who was kind of a, a very a weird guy. And he went on and on in his rapid style New York um, uh, style of speaking. Um, and then eventually, uh, well, I was listening. I was totally absorbed in everything. Uh, and I, I didn't utter a word, which was, I guess was kind of uncharacteristic of me, or he thought so. So uh, at some point, he stopped. And he said, he started apologizing and, um, uh, and saying, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm monopolizing the, um, the conversation. Um, because he, he mistook it, my silence, for, for boredom. Um, 
But I assured him I wasn't bored, and I asked him to go on. But, but think of it, this is one of the greatest economists in the world um, who was giving me a private seminar, and he thought that he was boring me. Um, and, and I mean, that, that's just the kind of guy he was. I mean, he, he was extremely humble. One last um, story about his humility. Uh, at at the, uh, um, co uh, uh, one of the earliest Austrian conferences in the United States in 1974, South Royalton Conference, uh, Walter attended, a number of people here attended. Um, Murray gave a, a, a talk in which he, for the first time, publicly criticized Mises about his utilitarian ethics rather than natural rights. And uh, at the end of it, Murray came back and we said, oh, great talk. And, and, and he says, ah, I'm still a little shaky. So this is the first time I ever, I, I ever um, criticized my mentor, Mises, in public. I mean, so he was 50 years old. He was a prodigious scholar. Um, he was probably the, the, he was the greatest Austrian economist in the world at that time. And yet he had the proper respect for, for his mentor and for, for his predecessors, okay? So the, I think that the one lesson I took from that was that you, you do want to, economics is not a dead end, you do want to advance it, but you always want to do so by building on the work of, of your predecessors like Mises and Rothbard. Thank you. When I think of Murray, I think of Murray's living room. That's where I met Murray. That's where I spent a lot of time with Murray. I want to mention all the people who were part of the living room, and then I'm going to ask the people in the room here who were on this list uh, to stand. Uh, Bob Smith, Leonard Liggio, Joe Peden, Ralph Rako, Ron Hamaway, Jerry Wallows, Larry Moss, Walter Grinder, Carl Hess, Father Sadowski, SJ, uh, Chuck Hamilton, uh, these are people who have been in the living room three or more times. Roger Garrison was there once, and at around midnight, he's a polite guy he's from Alabama. They're polite, not like people in New York City. And uh, at around 12, he's making moves like he should leave. And Murray's saying, you know, <laughs> stay, Roger. And, you know, Murray stays until 3 or 4 in the morning. Uh, Joe Salerno, John Hagel, Mario Rizzo, Jerry O'Driscoll, and of course, Joey Rothbard, although she wasn't really part of the living room. She was sort of, I don't know what, but I have to mention her as part of the living room. So would the people who are in this room please stand? That's Joe and John Hagel. John, there he is, way in the back. Did I leave out anyone else who was part of the living room? David Jarrett. David Jarrett, OK, great. Thank you. Um, uh, George Reisman was part of the Circle Bastia, which was a group that uh, ended before I got there. I got there in around 65 and uh, maybe 66. Uh, so uh, the living room, as far as I'm concerned, the Mises Institute is just the living room grown big. Uh, I don't mean to insult the Mises Institute. I mean to compliment the Mises Institute by saying that it's the embodiment of what Murray really wanted. And th that was the living room for me. Uh, Joe Salerno mentioned the uh, Royalton thing, and I want to mention a contribution of Joe's here. Uh, the question came up, what was responsible for the renaissance of the Austrian movement? Was it uh, Hayek's winning of the Nobel Prize, which occurred roughly at the same time as the Royalton Conference? Now, the Royalton Conference had three speakers, Kirzner, Rothbard, and Lachmann. And uh, there were, oh, maybe 35 or 40 people, uh, like Joe and I, graduate students, and maybe uh, beginning professors. And Joe's point is that, uh, how did those 40 people get there? It couldn't be because of Hayek's Nobel Prize, which occurred like uh, within a few months of that. And Joe, I think, rightly points out that the renaissance of the uh, Austrian movement was man economy the state in 62. Uh, that's how I got to know Murray. I would read man economy and state all day, and then at night I'd go play risk with him. It was the uh, sort of cognitive dissonance because I, I wanted to be worthy of Murray, and the only way I thought I could be worthy of Murray was to criticize him. I'm a little weird, uh, but that's the way I thought I would uh, impress him, that uh, I was really loving what he was doing. And he just wanted to be friends with me, and, and I couldn't get that. It's sort of like, you, you can't be friends with Mozart. I mean, Mozart, you know, how can, he, how can Murray want to be friends with me? And he did. It was the most amazing thing. He wanted to be friends with everyone. Boy, time goes fast when you're having fun here. <laughs> doesn't feel good. 
When I was young, I would keep track of how many words I would uh, write in a day. How many pages, 300 words a page, uh, uh, five pages would be 1,500 words. And if I did 1,500 words or five pages, I felt I was OK. And I didn't always make it, but some, many a day I would write five pages and sometimes 10. One day I got up early in the morning, and I stayed until 2 the next morning, and I wrote 23 pages. So I call Murray, and I say, well, you know, uh, who's the macho man here? I, I wouldn't dare compare quality, but I'm just comparing quantity. And uh, Murray goes, wah, wah, who, who keeps track of that? And I, I was pushy then, I'm pushy now, and I, I insisted that Murray, you know, tell me how many pages he, he writes. And he said, eight pages an hour. So in my best day of 23 pages, I did roughly three of his hours. Again, I don't compare quality. I just compare quantity. Uh, that was <laughs> a professional typist could type faster than Murray. They can do 100, 110 words an hour. Murray couldn't do that much. But I mean, he's writing new stuff. Uh, it was just amazing. I remember one time, uh, uh, Joey, we were in the living room, and somebody said, uh, Murray, uh, you're giving a, a, a paper uh, tomorrow. And Murray says, what, what? And uh, he wasn't prepared. And he just went into his room, and three hours later, he came out with you know uh, 15 pages worth of uh, stuff. So I mean, the reason he is so productive is that he, he types fast and he thinks fast. I disagree with Murray on several things. Um, Guido said that we're not a museum, we're not a Randian cult. We're allowed to disagree with each other. Murray disagreed with Mises. Uh, uh, Murray was pro-choice. Ron is pro-life. You can't get two uh, libertarians with greater credentials than that. They're 180 degrees apart. We're not a cult. We can disagree with each other. I disagreed with Murray on abortion, immigration, voluntary slavery, Israel. Sui, uh, money is sui generis, or is it a, a, a product good? Uh, cost, the Hayekian triangle. Uh, is a wage and time preference an empirical relationship or an apodictic one? I'm a co-author with Joe on that one. I'm a co-author with Peter Klein on uh, homogeneity and the division of labor. Um, uh, Israel, I disagree with. To my mind, the litmus test is, do you love and respect and revere uh, Murray? And if you do, you're a Rothbardian, even if you don't agree with him on everything. And I am certainly a Rothbardian. Murray used to like soap operas. When I first saw that, I thought, you know, that's sort of low, soap operas. <laughs> and yet I like Big Bang, which is just a soap opera, so I'm some uh, Rothbardian on that. Uh, Joey used to criticize Murray on opera, because Murray would want to sing all the parts, the soprano, the bass, <laughs> whatever. And Joey would say, no, no, you, you can't sing all the parts. And Murray would say, no, no, I can. And they had great arguments. Murray stole a lot of my ideas. <laughs> it's true, he published 20 years before I ever thought of it. <laughs> but we don't, we don't mention that. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of my work is a derivative of Murray's. Uh, Murray had one line in Manny Communist State on blackmail. I put blackmail in my Defending the Undefendable, and I have a whole book on blackmail. Um, Murray uh, favored private property. I have a series on private roads, private oceans, and now I'm coming out with a book on private space and you know privatization of moon and Mars. I don't like to brag, but I will. I think I'm the only co-author of Murray Rothbard's. It happened when I was uh, the associate editor of the RAE Review of Austrian Economics, predecessor to what Joe is now editing as QJAE. Uh, another thing that I've got over Murray is uh, he never won the Rothbard Medal of Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Ha <laughs> ha. I follow Murray in many ways. Uh, uh, he had a, a wide correspondence with everybody. I have a wide correspondence, too, and I put a lot of that on LouRockwell.com. Uh, he insisted everyone call him Murray. I insist everyone call me Walter instead of Dr. Block or Doc Block. Sounds silly. Uh, I encourage my students. He encouraged his student. I was never a formal student of his, but I am a, a student of his. I have another honor. One time, Murray was teaching at Brooklyn Polytech, and he couldn't make it, and he asked me to substitute for him. And I substituted for Murray, so that's something that I can brag about. My whole career is predicated on, if I do this, will Murray be proud of me? And if he is, I'll do it, and if he's not, I won't. Thanks for your attention.